Welcome to the HC Insider Podcast, a podcast dedicated to the commodities sector and the people within it. I'm your host, Paul Chapman. Today we're taking another look at hydrogen, and this time our guest is questioning its role in the energy transition from both its efficiency and its effectiveness. This brings in a broader point, as many organizations face pressure from investors and stakeholders to invest in new technologies that promote sustainability, which ones will actually work and how can organizations go about challenging and tackling some of the hype? Our guest is Paul Martin. Paul has been a chemical engineer for over 30 years, working closely with hydrogen itself in a variety of technological applications, and also has his own research company and consultancy called Spitfire Research. As always, you can support the show by leaving us a review and a rating on the platform you're listening on. We're talking today about energy transition in general and further in particular hydrogen, which is very much seen as this kind of something for everyone, the Swiss army knife, I think the term you, you've used in energy transition. We ourselves have done a number of episodes on it and we're going to work through what are actually some of the challenges and then I think draw a conversation more into how existing participants and investors can think a little bit more um, critically about some of these proposed solutions. That's a lot to get through. (laughs) Can you just start us off and can you just give us the playbook on hydrogen and and kind of what's out there in the media, the blue and the green and and how it all fits together? Yeah. So the challenge, the challenge here is hydrogen is very much being pitched as if it were a Swiss army knife. And the irony of that is delicious, honestly, because if you look at a Swiss army knife and you think about what a Swiss army knife is, it's a tool that you carry around in your pocket to sort of fumble your way through tasks when you go camping. It's not a particularly good tool for any of the purposes that you put it to. It's not, it's not a very good knife. It's a terrible screwdriver, you know, can opener, et cetera. It's just not particularly good at any of the tasks that you might want to put it to. And that's kind of like what hydrogen is in terms of it being a decarbonization strategy. The pitch is that hydrogen is the most abundant element, which is true, but meaningless because it's never found in isolation. It's always found combined with something else like oxygen. So separating it from the oxygen takes a lot of energy. It's pitched as a decarbonization solution when it's actually a gigantic decarbonization problem because 98.7% of the gas is made from fossils without carbon capture at present. There really isn't any green hydrogen to speak of, nor any blue hydrogen blue hydrogen being hydrogen that's made from fossils with carbon capture and green hydrogen being hydrogen that's made by electrolysis using renewable or non-emitting energy. And it's also pitched as the replacement, the obvious replacement for a lot of our fossil fuel uses. So you just do a fuel swap. It's nice and simple. Keep using the same equipment more or less. Just use hydrogen instead of natural gas as an example or hydrogen instead of gasoline as an example. And that analogy of the Swiss army knife is very accurate. And the irony is just delicious because it's not a good fit for any of those applications, actually. And it's a massive decarbonization problem that we must solve if we want to continue eating in a decarbonized future. It's not like we have tons of it kicking around to waste in inefficient uses as a heating or transport fuel. So that frames us up nicely, and we're going to work through some of the challenges that are underlie that picture you painted of hydrogen. There are, of course, substantial policies, particularly in the EU. There are substantial pushes and investments from existing oil and gas companies to promote hydrogen to get into it. And every day you see an announcement about a new facility or a new venture. Am I right in saying that obviously one of the key motivators for the oil and gas industry, the the hydrocarbon industry to be behind hydrogen is, of course, that it does continue to use the same infrastructure. Well, I know know you don't answer this, but it continues to use the same asset, their reserves, and give it some value. Is is that a, a key motivator here? Yes. So the way I best heard it put was by Michael Liebreich. Michael's the founder of Bloomberg NEF. The way he put it is that for the fossil fuel industry, hydrogen is a no lose bet. It's win-win. It either delays electrification, 
And by so doing, because the oil and gas companies don't supply electricity, the oil and gas companies win as a result of that delay. Or they get dragged into the future of energy supply in a decarbonized future by virtue of massive amounts of government subsidy for the production of hydrogen from their fossil assets, and they win. But really, another uh, fellow, a good friend of mine named Alex Grant, who's actually a prominent figure in the uh, development of lithium production technologies, he and I put together an op-ed about a year ago that basically called out what we really saw going on. And that is that what's really going on is the fossil fuel companies, assets in the ground that their investors need to see as having value, otherwise their share values will fall. And in the decarbonized future, most of those assets in the ground are not assets, in fact, they're liabilities. And hydrogen continues the myth that the assets are liabilities, uh, sorry, that the assets are assets and not liabilities. So that's what's really going on here. You're being sold a bill of goods. And then there, of course, there are the, that's the main pitch, but the side pitch is the hangers on, you know, the, what I've been very impolitely referring to is the useful idiots, the people who think that they're going to be making such giant quantities of renewable electricity that the grid won't know what to do with it. And hence they have to make something out of it to make money and hence hydrogen. And we're going to need to do a gigantic amount of that just to replace the black hydrogen in the world. And fair enough, that's a great thing. But the trouble is that they're feeding into this narrative that hydrogen is the solution to all of these so-called difficult to decarbonize sectors of the economy. And my retort to that is, well, if there are difficult to decarbonize sectors of the economy and hydrogen might be the solution for those, then clearly there must be easy to decarbonize sectors of the economy. And that's where we should be spending our money. Yes. Yeah. Isn't that logical? I mean, it's just patently obvious to me that that's what we should be doing. We shouldn't be fooling around with hydrogen uses as a fuel when hydrogen hasn't been decarbonized at all. I mean, 98.7% of it is made from fossils without carbon capture at present and in giant quantity. I mean, we make 120 million tons of hydrogen a year in the form of pure hydrogen and syngas, and almost none of it is blue or green. So why are we thinking that we're going to solve that problem in a rap in rapid order and then use it to decarbonize uh, hard to decarbonize sectors when we're basically not making a whole lot of progress decarbonizing the easy to decarbonize sectors like most of transport, most of heating, etc. It's just, uh, you know, it's not adding up. And the reason it's not adding up is it's not intended to add up. It's a deception. So let's get into it and, and use your... Uh chemical processing engineering background, because, you know, I think there are obviously a lot of opposing views to this. And there are a lot of people of who are very smart and are passionate about this technology and its, and its applications. And I see this very much as kind of arming us all with the, the right questions to ask when we, when we hear about these ventures. The first fundamental challenge that you've raised in the various number of your papers and so forth is ultimately the one of, it's pretty immutable, the challenge of thermodynamics. Can you walk us through how that pertains to hydrogen as a fuel and why there are probably lots better options? There are really two use case pathways for hydrogen that are being pitched in the future. Right now, hydrogen is used as a chemical reagent. It's not used as a fuel basically at all. It's used in the preparation of certain fuels but it's not used as a fuel pretty much at all. So these two pathways that people are considering are the electricity pathway and the heating pathway. So we'll take the electricity pathway first. So let's say you're going to start with, not with fossil fuels, but with electricity. The first thing you do is you feed electricity into an electrolyzer and you throw away 30% of the energy. And what you end up with is 70% of the energy you started with in the form of the lower heating value of hydrogen. So basically, this is one of the key things. You put in an absolute barest minimum of 39 and a half kilowatt hours per kilogram of hydrogen to satisfy the first law of thermodynamics. That's because if you're gonna start with water and you're gonna make hydrogen, you have to put in the amount of energy equal to what you'd get back if you burned the hydrogen to make water again. That's just the basics, and that's called the higher heating value, and it's 39 and a half kilowatt hours per kilogram. But when you're done, 
you only get 33 kilowatt hours per kilogram that you can use for energy production purposes because that's the lower heating value. And the difference, six and a bit, six and a half kilowatt hours per kilogram, is the heat of condensation of the product water, and it's lost for good. Now, that would be great if you could actually make hydrogen for 39 and a half kilowatt hours per kilogram, but in reality, you can't because there are losses in that process. Anytime you change energy from one form to another, the second law says you're going to lose something. And you lose quite a lot when you do electrolysis. So the bleeding edge state of the art, the very best that you can do in the world, starting with water and electricity to make hydrogen, is about 70% in lower heating value terms. So you have to put in about 47 kilowatt hours per kilogram. And a real electrolyzer that you could buy that produces hydrogen at a little bit of pressure and so on, it actually takes up to 65 kilowatt hours per kilogram. So the efficiencies aren't even as good as 70%, as I mentioned. And that's just making hydrogen. And the trouble is that by making hydrogen from electricity, you've actually taken a step backward in terms of the thermodynamic energetic value so you should just use the electricity basically yeah yeah i, I mean i won't bore you with it there's a term that we engineers use that's, that's called exergy exergy sounds complicated but really it's just the potential of a unit of energy in some form to be converted into work or mechanical energy or something that's readily converted into work or mechanical energy. So electricity is basically work on tap. So its exergy value is about one joule per joule or one kilowatt hour per kilowatt hour or 0.9 or something like that. But heat or chemical energy that is really a proxy for heat is not given a full exergy value. It, it's worth less. It's like comparing two units of money and calling them both dollars, right? And they're both dollars. But one's Jamaican dollars and the other's American dollars. They're not worth the same just because they're called dollars. And that's true with heat and work or heat and electricity or chemical energy and electricity. So you've actually taken an exergy step backwards by making this hydrogen. So now we've got this hydrogen at 70% of the original value, best case, like bleeding edge best case, at a, at using an electrolyzer you cannot afford because it's current density is so low that it's just giant. Now we have to store it and that even to store it in the most basic way, which is compressing it uh, to make it into a high pressure gas, that's about 90% efficient. And then assuming we don't have to move it anywhere, we're going to use it right where we made it. So we don't have any transmission losses. We're going to convert it back to electricity again in a device like an engine or a fuel cell. And as it turns out, big engines and fuel cells are about the same efficiency. They're about 60% efficient based on the lower heating value. And by the time you multiply out those efficiencies, you know, 0.7 times 0.9 times 0.6, all of which are bleeding edge best case, by the way, very difficult to get better than that. You're left with 37% of the energy that you started with. So the only conclusion you can draw from that is hydrogen is a terrible battery. And that's best case. I mean, there will be no invention in the future ever that will take that to 50%. Okay, so that's pretty compelling. Just one question on that. That's starting with electrolysis. Uh, that's right. Electricity. Mm -hmm. There are other technologies out there. I don't really want to get into specifics, but where it's adding a reagent or it's adding, you know, you're, you're, you're basically doing something in a reservoir, whatever it might be, and you're creating hydrogen without using electro, without using electricity, other forms of energy. So if you start with methane, right, and you feed it to a steam methane reformer, and let's pick a gigantic one that's world class, okay, sort of best in class, brand new best-in-class steam methane reformer. That's how we make most of the hydrogen in the world right now, using steam methane re uh, reformers. About 30% of the energy in the feed methane is lost. So the conversion efficiency starting from methane to hydrogen is about 
70% of the lower heating value of the feed methane. So it's pretty much, and again, that's bleeding edge best case. That's the best we've managed to get steam methane reformation efficiency. And that's, by the way, not including any energy to capture or store carbon dioxide. That's assuming we get to use the atmosphere as a big public sewer for that stuff. Let's say that we want to recover that CO2 and we want to bury it. Well, that takes energy that has to come from somewhere. And it's not a small amount because about half of the, the CO2 that comes out the uh, gas purification train of the uh, steam methane reformer is easily captured. But the other half comes out of burner flues. And it's hard to capture. Post-combustion CO2 capture takes a lot more energy because it's a lot more dilute. It's CO2 mixed with a swamp of nitrogen. And I, I want to come back to carbon capture because I think that's a, a whole segment on its own. The point is, though, that the energy efficiency loss is about the same with the best way of making hydrogen from natural gas without carbon capture as it is in terms of making uh, hydrogen from electricity and water, except, of course, in one case, you're starting with perfect exergy, you know, electricity that can be perfectly converted to work. In the other case, you're starting with the fuel and making another fuel out of it with a 30% loss. Neither of them are particularly good, but electrolysis is a lot worse in terms of uh, energy efficiency. And, and the other part, so, okay, so that's the power piece. What about the heat side of hydrogen? So first of all, you've lost 30% of your energy and it's gone for good. And if you're doing comfort heating, you get the heat of uh, condensation of the product water back. So it's not quite as bad. When you multiply out the um, efficiencies, it ends up being on the order of 60% efficient for best case for comfort heating, where the temperatures are low enough that you can use the heat of condensation of product water. It's a lot worse if you're making high temperature heat because you lose the heat of condensation of product water, which for hydrogen is really high. It's six kilowatt hours per kilogram, as I mentioned. So idea of using hydrogen as a way to replace the fuel that you made the hydrogen from is only predicated on the notion that you're going to bury the CO2. And it's predicated on the notion that burying the CO2 at some centralized hydrogen production plant is going to be feasible, whereas burying the CO2 from your home boiler or furnace or the like is going to be impossible. And that's the whole notion that it's predicated on. And it sounds that's, you know, fair enough. But the challenge is that when you start with a fossil fuel like methane, you have two sources of equivalent global warming potential. And one of them is the CO2 that you're emitting, which is fo of fossil origin and raises the CO2 concentration in the atmosphere. And the other is the methane leakage, which is an inevitable result of producing methane by drilling wells. And especially if you have to hydraulically fracture them in order to get the methane to flow out, you get quite a bit of leakage in production and distribution. And that methane on the 20 year time horizon is about 86 times the global warming potential of CO2. Yeah, much worse. That's right. So the basic premise of that argument, well, the facts are that you have is energy inefficient compared to just using electricity, for example. That itself, though, I probably would hazard that wouldn't preclude it from being part of the energy transition mix because we've all got to make sacrifices to achieve decarbonization if there was sufficient policy support and other things. And that's putting carbon capture aside. Totally agree with you. So. The problem with hydrogen is that it is neither efficient nor effective, okay? So right now, today, we trade efficiency for effectiveness with great willingness. As an example, we burn gasoline in cars, and that is the triumph of effectiveness over efficiency because the engine is terrible. It's inefficient. It's around 25% efficiency, closer to 20% if you look from source to wheels. And that's terrible. I mean, that's really awful, but it's so effective that it's worth it. Hydrogen's problem is that it isn't effective. It's a high energy density per unit mass fuel, but its energy density per unit volume is so terrible that it's very difficult to store, to distribute, and to use as a fuel in anything like a vehicle. And it's even difficult 
to use in a conventional gas distribution uh, system for reasons associated with the nature of the hydrogen molecule. And those things add up to hydrogen being basically a really bad idea as a fuel. So I want to dig into this. So basically it comes down to, yes, the technological applications of hydrogen then, that effectiveness. And there seems to be one big bucket is, is, is transporting it at scale, you know, there's, there is this, and I'm certainly guilty of it myself, thinking that you could just put it in a natural gas pipeline. Can you zoom in on transportation of hydrogen? And I think at the moment, most of it's just used on site, right? So this isn't a, there's no infrastructure. Not most of it. Substantially all of it in the world is used right where it's made. That is a bit of a problem, as you can imagine. People are having this notion that we're going to make hydrogen in, say, Western Australia and transport it to Japan by ship. Whereas right now we don't move hydrogen further than across the gate to the next plant where they use it. Major hydrogen users are all co-located with hydrogen plants. That's just the way it's done so that you distribute something other than hydrogen because that's practical and economic and distributing hydrogen isn't. So let me describe to you just how big a deal this is. In the United States, there are approximately 2,000 miles of hydrogen pipeline, which sounds like a lot, but they're all located connecting one chemical plant to another or one refinery to another or a link of them together, like in the Gulf Coast of the United States. And that's the deal. The reason that those plants are connected to one another is not actually to move substantial quantities of hydrogen ever but rather for outage prevention. So that if this guy's steam methane reformer goes down, his refinery doesn't have to go down. He can draw hydrogen from other refineries. In the United States, so remember we said 2,000 miles of um, hydrogen pipeline. There are 2 million miles of natural gas pipeline. So that should give you an idea of just how little hydrogen is moved relative to how much natural gas is moved. It's a trivial amount. Can you just go into why that is, just the chemistry of that? Sure. It's got a giant volume. It's got a very poor energy density per unit volume. And as a consequence, that makes it energy inefficient to move. So to move a joule of energy as hydrogen takes three times as much energy as to move a joule of natural gas. And that's irreducible as a result of thermodynamics. You can't fix it. And there's also sort of I mean, more prosaic, at least to my mind, is that the idea that you're struggling to get the same pipelines aren't also capable of transporting hydrogen either, right? Right. Now, and they are in terms of capacity. So let's be clear here. They are in terms of capacity. They are capable of transmitting about 90% of the number of joules as hydrogen as they could as natural gas. That's, I mean, that varies. It depends on pressure and it depends on the energy content of the natural gas locally, but round numbers, it's about right. About 90% of the capacity could be achieved with hydrogen. The trouble is that the expensive pipes are the ones that carry the gas long distances, like say from an offshore platform onshore or from one country to another. And those pipelines, they're not made out of mild steel. They're made out of steels that have higher strength and higher carbon content, because that's the most economical way way to make them if they're going to carry natural gas. And for natural gas, it's perfectly acceptable. Even adding a comparatively small amount of hydrogen to those pipes reduces their fatigue life considerably. And I've got numerous references on that from both people who own those pipes and from metallurgists. So I'm pretty solid on that. I think that there are people who imagine that there are things that you could do in order to reduce impact of of that. But the reality of the situation is that not the distribution grid, but the transmission grid, the pipes that carry uh, gases long distance, they cannot be used with hydrogen more than small amounts, like say an absolute maximum of 20% by volume hydrogen in natural gas. And this is where it gets complicated because people think 20% sounds like a lot. It does sound like a lot, but it's 20% by volume. We measure gases, gas concentrations by volume or or by moles, if you want to be technical about it. And that 20% doesn't hold much energy, basically. That's right. It's only 6% of the energy. And let's say that you were to make that 20% by volume hydrogen using some perfectly green process that had no CO2 emissions. The absolute maximum percentage 
that 20% hydrogen and natural gas would reduce the greenhouse gas emissions is therefore six over 86 or 7%. Yeah. So it's not really a very effective way. And it's actually a very expensive way per ton of CO2 emissions averted to eliminate CO2 emissions. I'm getting slightly more and more depressed. Okay, so... Uh, oh, we're not done yet. <laughs> I know, I know. We've got energy in- inefficiency. We've got challenges around transportation, at least at distance and at scale. Yes. Assuming that you can make your hydrogen on site and pull your fuel cell equipped vehicle up to extract that hydrogen and, and drive off so you don't have to transport at distance and you're fine because policies are supporting the lower energy efficiency because it, can you zoom in on the technology around the fuel cell because you made a really interesting comment in one of your papers where unlike the lithium battery ion battery there's no higher value product that's driving the development of the hydrogen fuel cell itself or just these hydrogen engines whatever you might want to call them where are we at on that and are they at least real so let's first talk about why you would use hydrogen instead of using a battery the whole idea there is that it's faster to refuel and that's true in the limit i mean it's it's true if you can actually if you actually have a hydrogen station on your on your route and uh, you can pull up to it and it has hydrogen you can dump the hydrogen into the tank you can do that faster than you can recharge a battery at present however it costs over three times as much energy and over five times as much per mile driven to do that so ask someone how long are you willing to wait to refuel if the fuel costs you five times as much and people will probably think pretty quickly that it's not a bad deal to sit around for a little bit to wait for a battery to recharge and the reality when you compare the Toyota Mirai fuel cell car to the Tesla Model 3 long range version, which have exactly the same range. In fact, the Tesla has a little bit longer range per the EPA drive cycle. The Tesla is cheaper, considerably cheaper, accelerates twice as fast, and it has the same range as mentioned. It's lighter and it uses a a third as much energy and costs a fifth as much per mile driven to refuel. So the value proposition for hydrogen for cars and light trucks, as far as I'm concerned, that idea is just a dead dog. And the, the problem with hydrogen distribution is not just in the pipelines that we were just talking about. It's, it's the refueling stations where now you have to produce hydrogen at 700 bar, 10,000 PSIG. Pressures are really Uh, substantial and it takes a lot of energy to do that but the problem is when the gas expands it heats up so you have to pre-cool it in order to be able to shove it into the tank without overheating the tank so refueling quickly with hydrogen is not as easy as people make out now where you were going with this is the uh, path to scale too right so the thing about lithium-ion batteries is that they had this wonderful path to scale called cell phones and and um laptops and portable electronic devices, which were willing to pay, you know, $3,000 a kilowatt hour for the initial batteries because they were the best thing that existed on earth and they made the technology feasible. And that provided a path for the so-called rights law reduction in price per kilowatt hour as a result of people making more and more and more of them because people were willing to buy unsubsidized the initial production, which was very expensive, which doubled the production, which dropped the cost a bit, which meant that more applications suddenly became able to use um, lithium ion batteries. Like, you know, they went from cell phones and laptops to power tools, as an example, which is a, a larger market in terms of kilowatt hours. And then the production doubled and the cost dropped even further. And eventually people like Elon Musk started thinking, hey, you know, these things might one day be cheap enough to use in cars. And that's what happened. There was a path to scale. And the trouble for hydrogen fuel cells, I mean, the troubles for hydrogen fuel cells are many, but the trouble for hydrogen fuel cells is that the path to scale is very questionable. It basically requires people with gigantically deep pockets to spend billions and billions of dollars subsidizing fuel cells that are too expensive until they've made enough of them that they're cheap enough to sell. And the trouble is that the hydrogen fuel cell car for the reasons that I just mentioned, is dead. And so cars and light trucks are not that path to scale. 
And so, you know, this is right out of the mouth of the fellow that's the head of the hydrogen push at uh, Hyundai, which is one of the two firms still left thinking about hydrogen as a transport fuel. And he really sees hydrogen as having some hope in, in trucks, which I similarly don't think there's, there's a hope for hydrogen in trucks. But he thinks there's a hope for hydrogen in trucks. But his worry is that without the scale of cars, the fuel cells will be too expensive in trucks to make them make sense. And I agree with him. He's right. They will be too expensive to use in trucks and people won't use them in trucks anyway because electric trucks will be cheaper. And those applications where batteries don't fit in trucks like remote and rural transport, you know, driving off into the Australian outback or on an ice road up into uh, northern Canada, those applications won't be used with hydrogen for fuel logistics reasons because there will be no hydrogen waiting for them at the destination to refuel them. So they'll use biofuels and there's no meat in the electricity will eat the low end of range and, and, and the like, and biofuels will eat the high end for logistics reasons. And there's no meat in the middle left for hydrogen. So hydrogen is dead for transport on the ground. In my opinion, it's also dead for transport in the air and it's very questionable for ships. So I don't think it's a good transport fuel at all. Irrespective of whether it should be used as a transport fuel, do you think there is the the likelihood, the possibility that we will see it used at scale in transport? No, I don't. I think people will. I think people will use it at, to make transport fuels. I think that's a real thing. That'll really happen. They'll use it as a way to make transport fuels, just like we do today. Except there'll be different transport fuels. So there are two classes of transport fuels that hydrogen can be used to make. One is biofuels. So there are, there are benefits to using green hydrogen to boost biofuels yields. And we may need to do that because we may not be able to make enough biofuels without their problems, which are competition with food and pricing and land use and all that stuff. Uh, so we may have to use hydrogen to, to boost biofuel seals. The other one is basically trying to run combustion backwards by taking the combustion products, water and CO2 and electricity and using the electricity to make hydrogen and then using hydrogen to reduce chemically CO2 back to fuels. And those fuels are called e-fuels and there's a bunch of different ones. There are carbon-based ones like uh, methanol and uh, liquids made by a process called fischer tropsch or the like. And then there is ammonia. And maybe hydrogen will be used to make fuels in those ways, but only if we're rich and really desperate because their energy efficiency will be so terrible that they'll be really, really expensive. Yeah. So there is the green hydrogen has a future. I'm going to come on to that a little bit Absolutely more Absolutely it does. Yes. We need it to keep eating. We obviously need it for the production of fertilizers. We also need to, uh, as you stated very clearly, tackle the issue of black hydrogen, right? And we'll come on to sort of some of the carbon pricing things that might drive that. But before we get there, let's do a little thought experiment. It won't take very long. Okay. Let's see what it would take to replace our existing, or, or not our existing hydrogen use, but the 90 million tons of hydrogen a year that we'll need in a decarbonized future, because about 30 we won't need because we won't be burning fossils anymore as fuels, and hence we won't need to desulfurize them. So let's think about what it would take to take 90 million tons of fossil hydrogen and make it with renewable hydrogen. Okay, make it, make it using electricity. If we take a, a 50 kilogram uh, kilowatt hours per kilogram figure, which is very optimistic, as I said, world lead, bleeding edge best class, uh, best in class is 47 percent. That would take 4,500 terawatt hours of green electricity or nuclear or wh whatever you can find that doesn't have any emissions, right? 4,500 terawatt hours just to replace the 90 million tons of hydrogen in the world that we use right now that we make from fossils without carbon capture that we'll need in a decarbonized future. And in 2019, if you add up all the wind and solar on earth, it added up to 2,100 terawatt hours. So if we used all of the wind and solar on Earth in 2019, we couldn't make half the hydrogen that we use today. <laughs> yeah. That's how big a problem of decarbonization hydrogen itself is. And we have to solve that before we can have any leftover to call usable for transport or heating. Yeah, such a stark comment that naturally the next thing most people say is, of course, carbon capture technology. Sure. Blue hydrogen. 
it seems like there are circumstances where this has been successful, but in very unique geographical or in certain environments. Can you just give us the challenge with carbon capture technology? Because it's sure. fascinating that although this could be such a solution, very little success has actually really been what am I trying to say here? Although it's had significant sort of attention, it has actually had relatively limited investment and there have been relatively few successes in making it commercially viable, at least without significant carbon taxes or pricing. Absolutely. So let's talk numbers. I, I like numbers being an engineer. Let's talk numbers because we have the numbers from the largest blue hydrogen production facility in the world. And that happens to be in my home country, Canada. It's in Alberta. It's on the Scottford upgrader, which is a bitumen upgrader. This is the so-called uh, tar sands or oil sands bitumen. Uh, it gets partially upgraded by adding hydrogen to it so that you can then refine it. And to do that, of course, you need hydrogen. And so they decided to use government money to remove about 65% of the CO2 from the hydrogen production at the Scottford upgrader in a project that was built by Shell that's called Quest. Okay, so that project has been constructed and it's been running successfully for four years. It cost $1.3 billion, uh, all of it being public money, and it costs $50 million per year to run. It has a projected life of 20 years. There's an ideal place, like big empty hole in the ground, which, which are comparatively rare, honestly, not very far away. I think it's only about 60 kilometers away where they pipe the CO2 to be disposed of. And it represents only 30% of the CO2 emissions of the Scottford upgrader. And that's just one bitumen upgrader just in Alberta. <laughs> okay. So, and that thing buries a million tons of CO2 per year and has done it for each year over the past four years, more or less. That's the kind of money we're talking about. And it's only very partial, 65% capture. It captures the easy 65%, which is the easy 30% of the emissions from one single bitumen upgrader. Mm. So it's not that we don't know how to do it. We know how to do it. We, chemical engineers know how to remove CO2. We do it every day. We do it every day to upgrade natural gas that has too much CO2 in it in order to make it marketable. We do it every day in chemical processes all over the world for all sorts of reasons. It's trivial. It's not complicated to do. It's basic, basic chemical engineering to do it. The problem isn't capturing it, although you can get better at capturing it. And the more diluted it is, the harder it is to capture and the more energy it takes to capture it. That's the second law again. The problem with CO2 capture isn't capture, it's storage. It's finding holes in the ground big enough and deep enough and durable enough to shove the CO2 into. <laughs> and those holes are in high competition, right? Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Well. And, it, you know, think about petroleum production. You know, at the beginning in the 1860s, what did we do? We drilled holes where oil was seeping out of the ground on its own. We knew the oil was there. We just had to get enough of it so we could, you know, produce it. And pretty quickly, we drilled all the holes that we could in all the places where the oil was seeping out of the ground on its own. And we started having to drill holes in places where there wasn't any oil seeping out of the ground. And then we had to eventually end up drilling holes in the deep ocean and various other places in order to get enough petroleum to satisfy our ravenous demand for the stuff. And the same would be true in inverse for carbon capture. But um, let's, um, let's imagine this. Can you imagine an industry with a scope and scale that basically moves three times as much mass as the fossil fuel industry does today in the reverse direction, all of which is paid for by carbon taxes. If you can imagine that you have a spectacular imagination because I certainly cannot. <laughs> okay. And hydrogen is just part of that. I mean, there's, it's a giant, giant thing. So yes, you can do CO2 capture on hydrogen production. You can do autothermal reforming where you actually don't you change the process around and you add oxygen in with the feed gas and partially burn it in place to make heat and then run it over a catalyst and you make hydrogen and the CO2 comes out with the hydrogen at pressure so it's easier to capture. And you might get 90% capture out of that process. But right now, nobody uses autothermal reforming to make hydrogen if they're trying to make hydrogen. And the reason is it's less energy efficient to do it that way and more expensive to do it that way than it is to use steam methane reforming. So they use autothermal reforming right now to make carbon monoxide hydrogen mixtures that are called synthesis gas. 
And when you need a high CO to hydrogen ratio, like in a methanol plant, you build an SMR, a steam methane reformer, and an ATR, an autothermal reformer, and you blend the gas from the two and you get the right mixture. And, you know, if you're talking about the possibility of people building lots and lots of giant autothermal reformers with oxygen plants on them in order to make hydrogen from natural gas and CO2 that you can then sequester and then compress and shove offshore near, you know, down a hole somewhere. The costs are just astronomical of those things. And no one is going to build them if they don't think they can run them for 30 years. And yep. then there's the methane leakage. <laughs> well, and there's also the actual, the cost and of the carbon intensity of all the infrastructure you're building there. But so you've got, it's a fascinating point that the carbon taxes could never get substantial enough to actually tackle this by carbon capture. Well, they could. They could get high enough. But the trouble is they also need to apply at 86 times to the methane leakage or else you're actually going to end up with more CO2 equivalent in the atmosphere when you're done from some places like the, you know, some places in the United States, there's methane leakage that adds up to three and a half percent. And that's not speculation. That's based on satellite measurements. My sort of questions are essentially, it sounds like the route to decarbonization all ultimately flows through electrification for all of the reasons you've stated. You do have a lot of companies, uh, investors looking at hydrogen-based products and other, other, other base projects as well, right? What do you think are the key questions that people can arm themselves with that when they're facing the latest investor deck and all of these organizations have a lot of pressure to acquire and invest in sustainable technology and so forth. And sometimes there can be a lot of pressure from above to want it to work. What do you think are the key questions that people can ask themselves? Because a lot of these people are more they, they're, they're more tuned to the financials, the, the NPV calculations. They are necessarily the, the chemical <laughs> equations behind it all. Right. Well, first question is, do the people that you're talking to have a vested interest in the outcome? <laughs> be, because that, that doesn't necessarily mean that they aren't telling you the truth, but it means that they're telling you telling you the truth potentially with their head nodding up and down, yes. And they're not telling you that equivalent truth with head nodding side to side, no, because that's not in their financial interest. So the best thing to do is to hire somebody who has experience with hydrogen and who has no vested interest in it either way. And, and you know, that's I'm not trying to sell my services, but that's kind of one of the things that I do. I'll put a link in the show notes. There might be there some interest. There you go. I, you know, that's an example of something that you can do because I, I honestly, I don't, I've made lots of hydrogen and I've made lots of money from making hydrogen. I've used lots of hydrogen. I've helped people try to not make hydrogen. <laughs> I've made lots of alternatives to hydrogen. So I really don't have a, a clear, uh, understandable bias uh, or vested interest one way or another. And I'm certainly not biased in the direction of batteries. Batteries have never done anything other than cost me money so far. But the point here is that the question you have to ask yourself is, are the people that are pitching this to you telling you the unvarnished truth or are they selling you something? And what do they, ha what do they stand to gain by selling you that thing that they're selling you? So my challenge with these sorts of projects is that they're often predicated on extrapolations long into the future in relation to cost. And sometimes those extrapolations are sensible. They're based on something that, that uh, has some validity. And sometimes they're just taken too far. As an example, here's the key question to ask yourself. Will hydrogen ever be cheaper than the electricity or the methane it's made from? I mean, that has an obvious answer. It's no, it never will be and never can be. But there are people out there who are trying to tell you that it will be. Now, why are they trying to tell you that it will be? Do they believe it or don't they? And there are places in the world where there's excess renewable electricity potential, and it's available at high capacity factor, which is incredibly important to uh, making money from green hydrogen ever. So this notion that you're going to make green hydrogen from just the renewable electricity that would otherwise not be used by the market, the stuff that will be curtailed, that's just nonsense. And no, nobody with any credibility believes that. 
what they're talking about is is uh, places like Western Australia, Western Chile, and a few other places in the world where there are, is a gigantic potential to generate renewable electricity from both wind and solar that happen to fluctuate in exactly the right pattern. You know, the sun shines during the day and then the winds pick up at night because the land cools down and the wind blows off the Western Ocean and, and you get this perfect combination of wind and solar. It gives you a high capacity factor. But those places also happen to be very far away from places that can use electricity as electricity. So they think, OK, potential to make money here. How do we make money? We make money by making hydrogen. But they right away end up with the problem. Well, OK, great. We've made this hydrogen. How do we get it to market? And the answer is you don't. You make ammonia. OK. And the reason you make ammonia is that you can ship ammonia and shipping hydrogen is just nuts. I mean, yeah, it's yeah, just madness. Yeah. You lose as much uh, energy making hydrogen as a liquid as you do making ammonia pretty much. And then you can use the ammonia directly or you can use the ammonia and crack it at the destination to make hydrogen again, which is kind of nuts as well. But the good thing that you could do here is you could get rid of black ammonia production by replacing it with green ammonia, and that would make excellent sense. I was going to say, it sounds like these are the kind of locations where we should be building our future chemical processing plants. That's right. Steel production, you know, iron reduction, iron ore reduction. Doing that in Western Australia is genius. And here's the thing that, you know, in a decarbonized future, of course, not in Australia as it is now, where there are no carbon taxes. It's very hard to imagine how a country with no carbon taxes is going to become the greatest producer of renewable, non-emitting steel or, or ammonia or whatever the case may be, aluminum, by basically trading in hypocrisy. That, that's unlikely to be the case. You have to have carbon taxes in place at substantial values in the world, such that the more expensive ammonia and the more expensive steel and the more expensive aluminum that's made without CO2 emissions has a market that will pay for it. I mean, that's just common sense, right? It's going to cost money to not make CO2 emissions. That's the reality. But the other question is, what about this whole idea? And this, is, this seems to be a very seductive idea, that there are these giant markets, South Korea and Japan, who are not good friends with their nearest land neighbors and who have gigantic, very energy thirsty populations and right now import a large amount of energy, and in the case of Japan, are have fallen out of love with nuclear power. So what are they going to do? And you know, a lot of people are saying, well, they'll they have no choice; they'll have to import hydrogen. Well, sounds great. Let's say that they have to import hydrogen. Round numbers, they're going to be paying something like five times as much per joule of energy as their competitors in the economic marketplace. So what kind of cars those guys end up driving is irrelevant because they'll be bankrupt. You know, they're, 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 none of their energy intensive portions, of their economy, their, their industrial base will be able to compete if they're paying such giant multipliers on the cost of energy. And that would be substantially all of their energy, not just a little bit of it like, like now. I mean, the Japanese and Koreans pay quite a bit for natural gas, quite a bit more than they pay for natural gas in the United States. But we're talking about such a huge quantity of energy and such a large fraction of their energy base that it would be economic suicide for those countries to transition to hydrogen. It might be necessary, but if, if it is necessary, it's going to come with a giant decline in their industry because the people that are right next door across uh, the ocean that they could be buying HVDC cable supplied electricity from if they were friends will be their economic competitors and they'll be paying one fifth as much per unit of energy that they feed into their factories as the Japanese or the Koreans would be. So make friends, have <laughs> wide networks. Have lots of HVDC. That yeah. makes a lot more sense than shipping hydrogen as an energy source. I'm not sure how this uh, subject is necessarily going to be making friends. but <laughs> <laughs> Well, no, you, you need to make friends with people that you're dependent on for energy, don't you? Because your alternative is to conquer them. <laughs> yes. <laughs> that didn't work out so well for Japan in World War II. Pulling it all together, you've got these significant efficiency and effectiveness hurdles that likely preclude, in you know, your opinion, substantially backed up, preclude it from being used as a transport fuel or heating our homes. You've got this real challenge of 
it's a vital ingredient of the world economy and how we all get food. And that alone is a substantial carbon challenge just of the black hydrogen. So there's a need for green hydrogen there, absolutely. And then there's also some of these other tie-ups to do with potentially ammonia and so forth. You've got all these oil and gas companies that are investing in hydrogen. What do you see in the future? Is there a possibility that the pockets are so deep, the need so urgent for those organizations that we, we have a hydrogen economy pushed through anyway? Is this, a, is this like we were talking about hydrogen 30 years ago, it will be another false start? So here's the problem. You presumed the oil and gas companies are making massive investments in hydrogen. They're not. They're seeking massive subsidies from government in relation to hydrogen. They are not themselves making massive investments in hydrogen. They just aren't. If they were, I would pat them on the back and congratulate them for trying their best to have a future. That's not what they're doing. What they're doing is they have their hand out to governments for massive quantities of subsidy, which they are very, very effectively lobbying for in order to have government pull them into the future of energy supply. And they're doing that because that's in their financial interest to you know, harvest that subsidy, but also because even if they fail, it delays decarbonization by electrification for a while. So that's what's really going on. And you have to be careful also about differentiating between real projects and announcements or ribbon cutting ceremonies or MOUs or offtake agreements or whatever, all these proxies for real projects. There are people talking every day about the next 20 megawatt electrolyzer project being the next biggest one in the world. Okay, we've got two 20 megawatt electrolyzer projects now. Uh, so ours is the biggest in the world, it's 40. There's not a gigawatt of electrolyzers in the whole world yet. And we would need a thousand gigawatts of electrolyzers just to replace that 90 million tons of, of black hydrogen. A thousand. That's at 50% capacity factor, more or less. That's insane. It, you know, it, the, the scale of the challenge is absolutely enormous. And if the oil and gas companies were all over that, you know, actually addressing that challenge in an earnest way, using their own investment money, I would congratulate them. They're not doing it. What they're doing is, har is harvesting subsidy. And they're doing it so effectively that, you know, it's not just them, of course, it's the, the, the people that are pushing green hydrogen are doing a pretty good job of it too. As an example, in Canada, we had a hydrogen roadmap written for Natural Resources Canada by, you know, for hire by a firm. The two principal authors of that report are former long-term employees of Ballard, which is a maker of fuel cells. So policy captured by vested interest in this area is just enormous. And that's actually the tail that's wagging the dog, so to speak. And, you know, if it was just private money, they could bet and I could say, look, thermodynamics is against you, my friend, but I wish you the best. It's not private money that's being invested here. It's public money. And that could actually be spent on things that would really move the needle on decarbonization, which is why it makes me so upset, because I saw the same thing happening as a participant indirectly through through my employment in the late 1990s when people were pushing hard to make hydrogen into a uh, a way to decarbonize transport but less a way to decarbonize it and more a way to eliminate the toxic emissions from the tailpipes of cars and tons of money billions of dollars of government money was burned up for no apparent benefit in that round and this is just another round well Caveat emptor. It's been a, uh, a fascinating discussion. I really appreciate your time. I'm sure our audience do as well to get a, another view of um, hydrogen itself and some of the challenges in energy transition and some of the starkness of the problem as well. I encourage listeners, I may sound like I'm making a lot of assertions without proof. And I am, because in the interest of time, I can only really say what I think as opposed to developing the case fully. So if you want to see the case developed fully, take a look at the links to my articles where I do that. And I have a very smart following, uh, people that have you know forgotten more about some technologies than I'll ever know. And they review what I write and tell me when I've gone wrong. And then I correct what I've written so that it best matches reality. And as a consequence of that kind of peer review, if you will, not, not formal, but informal, those articles will defend my positions and they'll explain to you in detail why I think what I think and why I draw the conclusions I draw. 
I'm not claiming to be infallible or to be a clairvoyant and know what the future is going to hold, but there are certain things that we know pretty solidly and uh, you can draw those conclusions and, and see the references upon which they're based. Yes, and I will include links to those and you can also find you on LinkedIn. It's only been an honor for us to have you on and it's been a, an insightful and uh, informed commentary on, on uh, some of the challenges in energy transition. So thanks, Paul. I've really enjoyed it. It's been a pleasure speaking with you. Thank you for listening. If you enjoyed this episode and want to support the show, please give us a positive review on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. To find out more about HC Insider and Human Capital, a search firm dedicated to the commodities sector, go to www.hcinsider.global, where you'll find more original content on the commodities sector and more details on our offering as a search firm and our locations around the world. Thanks again for listening. Thank you.